Hello. Hello everyone. Sorry about that. I was just um, getting the all important Sunday morning coffee. Slurping away. Oh, who's here? Let's adjust the microphone. Hello Philip. Hello Patrick. Hello Curve Planner. And uh, yes. Something about a tremor of tremor this morning. Three or something like that. Ah, okay. No, I didn't see any of that. I was actually um, a bit of a late start this morning, hence a bit rushed. Um, a bit of a late night and didn't really get started to set up this session till about 25 minutes ago. So I haven't seen any of the news yet. Probably just as well. Hi, um, Razdin. How are you? Where's everyone from? I know, um, Philip's from South Australia. And I think Curve Planner's from one of the Midwest states. Anyway, let's um, I'll wait for you. There's a heck of a delay between me asking something and things appearing on on the uh, the chat. So, what's going on here? So this morning I'm back to the modular, and I'm always aware that there's much less interest in modular equipment than. Um, say my Volkers or some of the electrons and things but you know to be honest the modular stuff is much more flexible expansible um, and has much more potential I think than some of the other simps which is why I'm sticking with it hello Ryan and um, that's one of the reasons I'm still going with it. And I thought this morning I'd go through, as you probably read in the description, my approaches to ambient modular music. The um, the key, I think, for me is well to create something that I can listen to over and over again. And... Um, for it to have a certain level of complexity and richness it can be simple as well but it's um, certainly very uh, very rewarding when you get a good ambient patch going and to make things sound beautiful and that sort of thing so I'll be going through eight types of things for creating ambient music and while I'm going through those eight I'm going to simultaneously de-patch this because we're sort of going to start from scratch. This is just one I did um, last night, just playing around. Um, and then I can go through the different topics. So the topics are drones, and that's not the drones of the flying kind. Um, looking at, you know, those constant background noises that keep a piece pretty, pretty rooted in something. Then there's um, the melodic side and semi-generative. So there's um, the challenges with um, a lot of modular music is creating things that don't sound too repetitive. And I suppose that's one of the other big differences between um, between normal synthesizers is that sometimes they can sound repetitive because they are missing the um, the probability or the randomness that you get with um, modular equipment. I think I'm nearly depatched. That will do. Just that last one. And um, then, oh sorry, yeah. That's, so the generative melody, looking at Turing machines, random randomness, and that sort of thing. Looking at effects. I'll go through my rack in a minute, which is uh, different. I think from the last time I did a modular Sunday live few more additions, things have moved around. So effects 
um, I've got that sort of set up over here now, top right of the rack. And um, the sounds themselves, so and the difference between pure oscillators, analog oscillators, uh, wavetables, and sampling, and lots of differences in the types of sound you use in ambient. Obviously, none of them can be too um, too extreme unless you're doing sort of industrial sound effects based ambient, which obviously we can touch on. And if you've got any questions, by the way, and um, anything I'm showing, please ask away. Sorry, I'm fiddling with patch leads over here on the the right out of shot. Little annoying things. Um, then there's rhythmic elements. So ambient doesn't have to be just, of course, um, sort of slow, slushy, uh, bed-based things, pads and so on. It can be very much uh, sort of slow rhythmic as well and have a bit of a pulse. So I'll go through that. Uh, number six is fixed sequencing versus semi-random. So this is not just the notes but the actual um, sequence of notes. So how uh, how are they uh, running together? Is it probability gates? We'll look at that. Is it uh, arpeggiators? Is it broken arpeggiators? The list goes on um, and um, I'll be talking about that. The um, the seventh thing is quantizing. So, obviously, uh, quantizing in, in uh, normal synth world it normally refers to rhythm. Uh, quantizing here is much more about the um, keeping things in tune, which is why I have a bunch of quantizers. Um, 2HP tune, I've got um, the tip top quantizer. There's quantizers built into the ornament and crime here gone to sleep. There's, um, I've actually got a mosaic quantizer which normally sits here but it's off repair at the moment. Yes, modular things do do break sometimes. So quantizing is um, important but you can create really interesting ambient music just with non-quantized and we'll have a look at that too. And then live playing. Um, so I like the Q Nexus because of the form factor. I think the key step isn't too bad to go alongside this sort of mini rack, which as you know is a case and I can lift the whole thing up. Where's the top of the case? Let me break everything. So yeah, it's a um, portable rack with these um, hand grenade type hinges. And I can take this out on the cliffs and on the road, that sort of thing. Hello from Louisville, South Australia, Philip. Germany. Razdin, hello from Germany. Mississippi. Wow, all over. Very cool. So I'll just check the chat every now and then. And, sorry, what was I saying? Live playing. Um, I like to do live playing just, not just because it keeps me busy, but because it's a um, important sort of way to bring a human element in because it's it's all very well working with the you know semi-artificial intelligent Turing modules and things but bringing in oh, turn the effect down a bit bringing in some kind of human delays and all the flaws that come with human playing is nice as well so, um, and, and ask any questions on the way. Uh, I think someone said they can't participate with the listening. Um, so we'll start. So number one, I'll put these in chapters later and I'll have a slurp of coffee. <coughs> Different types of drones. So the um, the most obvious type of drone is literally, oh no, sorry, I was going to go through the rack first. So drones, drones, um, I'll go in a second, but the rack, just to explain what's going on. Um, I've got two analog synthesizers over here, the mini Doppler A116s. Uh, these are the sound sources. I've got a wavetable dual oscillator synth and the twin waves. 
I've got a whole bunch of things in the Disting EX here. She's gone to sleep, which is a multi sampler, which is a granular synth, which is a um, wavetable, and there's a whole bunch of other things as well. Just sequencing. I've got the Pluck 2HP, which is a um, sort of guitar y sounding thing. Actually, not this one, this is the Disting Plane. This. Be careful how hard I hit the Q Nexus. That sound is actually this microphone tapping away. I'm going to stop that tapping. All right. Um, so that's uh, some of the sounds, and I've got some rhythmic sounds up here: bass drum, specialized bit of gear from Tip Top, and um, the Pico drum. There are the sound sources. Uh, there's the, the Ornament Crime's got some sound as well. And I think that's... So there's a range of things. They're all going into the mixer here. Which is effectively two four-track stereo mixers. And then... Oh, thanks. Uh, Jedi-tastic. Uh, the Model Cycles. Yeah, the Model Cycles is... Um, Nice little portable instrument for doing ambient too. I uh, actually got it for sale at the moment on Reverb. Let's go and have a look at that. Um, mainly because I just use the Analog 4s more than anything now. Um, what was I saying? Yeah, so there's an 8-track input. I've also got a separate sort of sub-mixer, master mixer, the Tip Top uh, IntelliGel Mix-Up. This allows me to have two stereos going in, which is these two guys. And also two monos, so I've got the two rhythm going in as well. So effectively, this is a 10-channel setup, uh, modular. Uh, basically, one, two, stereo for the twin wave, stereo for the disting, uh, mono for the pluck, mono for the two drums as well. And it also leaves me an extra channel, so I can patch in things like the micro freak and stuff that I like to patch in. Um, so that's the sounds, the sequencing comes from quite a few things really. We've got the Hikari, which I mentioned before. It's a really kind of simple sequencer, even though it looks pretty. It's actually very hands-on, as we'll see later. The sequencing comes from, come from a random sample and hold generator, like this dot for A118, two, which we've actually got two of. There's a black one there and a white one there. So that's for random sequencing. There's a various range, uh, various types of sequencing on the ornament and crime from um, Turing type things, which we'll go through in a second. Uh, whatever sequencing we've got. Oh yeah, we've got the arpeggiator from 2HP down here. We've got the Turing module, which is a dedicated semi-AI generative type thing. Oh, good, Patrick. Yeah. Hopefully I'm, I'm, I'll talk about things that you want to hear. If there's anything else, Patrick, that I don't mention, just ask. Um, so that's the sequencing. And what else do I do with sequencing? Uh, for, for ambient, um, it's it can literally be um, infinite sustain type stuff as well. So we'll go through that. And then... Finally, what else is in the rack? Oh, effects. So I, I mentioned this um, FX aid from Happy Nerding, which is a Ukrainian company, or made in Ukraine at least. Um, so I've got two of those now. They're fully fledged effects modules. Very good long blue uh, Strymon type reverbs, that sort of thing. With delays, and it's also customizable. So I've actually loaded in 32 banks of effects. Where's my list? Which um, I'm still learning what they are. So I've got a crib sheet here with all the different effects on the FX aids up here. So there's two of them. I explain in a second. But you know, there's emulators of black hole, black cloud, clouds, um, big skies, uh, magnetos. They're all really good digital emulators with those. I've got two of them because they can only do one effect at a time. So if I've got like usually this black FXA dedicated to big reverbs, I need a sort of delay. 
So this one is usually on delay, but it also does modulation, chorus, compression, all sorts of things. And you can also double up on the reverbs. And I've also split the mixer. So this mixer for, which is the first four uh, instruments, go to this left one so I can put delay on those. And then this second batch of instruments, which is the disting, which has its own delay if I need it. And the two drums go to just this one, which is often the reverb. Um, and I can patch it so that the drums bypass all of the effects as well. So that's kind of what all this is. And this, this is permanently patched. So if you're thinking, oh, you pre patch something, it's not really. It's basically master out. That's a cockatoo in the background. It's very misty here at the moment, by the way, in Australia because of the floods or the heavy rain last night. And... Um, Cockatoos get annoyed when they can't see where they're flying. Anyway, um, so this is the, uh, sorry, yeah, the two outputs of these mixers go separately here. One of them bypasses this effect. And then the only other types of things are, there's another quantizer there, the only other types of things are uh, filters. I've got this wasp filter in the dirt. And... Um, then just a bunch of malts. Malts are useful for doubling up on the signal path and that sort of thing. Um, right, so... Oh, I've also got a MIDI... Uh, sorry, the disting, as well as having CV in. So the QNEX is a great little instrument because it has CV outs, so I can go direct into any instrument or effect or modulation source. Um, or it's good, I'm using the MIDI out of this as well into a little box around the corner, which, which goes onto this module, the MIDI, MIDI XO, which also converts from 5 pinned in to TRS MIDI. And that's rooted into the disting. So, uh, which is why I'm playing that. I don't think there's anything else. The only uh, Another thing I've upgraded is just the power source. I'm using this Row Power 45 MMS. Because I found the Behringers, having two of them, uh, caused a bit of hum. So I've gone for a much powerful, much more powerful unit. And I could actually power twice as many modules probably with that. Um, so it gives it a bit of overhead. Right, let's go back to number one again. Drones, different types of drones. So what I'm going to do now is probably as I explain everything, I'll gradually build a patch at the same time. But obviously isolating the thing I'm talking about. So, um, so drones, yeah, there's different types of drones. Most, uh, most people think of a drone as being a sort of low, low bass or pad type sound, perhaps with some modulation. So, and some filter sweeping. So sometimes if I'm creating a patch, I'll just use, for example, an analog, one of these analog simps here which has got built-in filters and VCAs to create a background drone just, just to give me something to build on. Um, uh, other types of drones can be granular based. So on the disting, for example, hopefully I've got one on here. Let's have a look. Um, so I've just loaded in a granular sound, I hope. Oh, I didn't load a, um, I'll just load in a WAV. So what I'm doing here, I know you can't see this tiny little display. Um, I'm just finding a waveform. So granular, if you don't know, is a bit like sampling. Um, in that, let's try that one. In that you load in a, um, a wave or a sound file and then granular sort of plays back tiny little parts of it really fast and then a cloud of them so I've just loaded in a um, something in C minor I think find out in a minute and MIDI still connected to this and you can move move the center point of the, the granulation around I think I've got that on a drone setting. Uh, so this, uh, the, 
most granulate or granular simps or modules or plugins have the ability to set um, a constant um, loop if you like and I can turn that off just make sure everything's turned off yeah so I've got three drones and each of those drones or loops if you like can be um, tuned differently or you can play it from the keyboard as well turn the octave down so another type of so this gives these very complex turn your mic down a bit this gives the kind of complex um, fluttery type background drones and you would often combine them with the um, like an analog synth drone as well in different registers and the way that granular works I'm doing I'm not doing a granular demo because that would take that would be a whole thing in itself um, there's there's lots of control you have over the sound in fact let's go to the uh, let's put the drone back on so you can hear it the the drone part of this granular synth on the disting so all you're hearing now is this and and here I can, as I move the center point around, you can, I don't know if you can see, but there's lots of little fluttery things around the center point. But as I move it, you can change chords, depending on where you are in the waveform. Um, and the way that granular works is you've got to control over some of the key things, like the rate, so that's the rate of how many times it fires. Um, to give it some variation, the rate spread, so that's the variation in how many times it fires. So if it's, um, what have we got set on at the moment for the rate? So it's 42 milliseconds. So it's going to play a tiny little piece every 42 seconds, uh, sorry, every 42 milliseconds. And then I've got a spread of about 20%. So that means uh, there's going to be 20% up and down around that. The other key thing is the size. That's how big the... Um, the grain is so I can adjust that to uh, for example it's on 100 milliseconds at the moment I can make it shorter and you get that fluttery effect if I make it longer you get much more of a musical type thing going on so that this is now 150 milliseconds and now we're getting into the sort of realms um, the realms of let it play so you can hear it the realms of um, almost sample looping where you'd grab like a tenth of a second or something. So I'll take it back to 100, which is uh, kind of the one I like. Um, and then there's a range of sizes, the size spread. There's pitch, you can vary the pitch, but if you want to be musical, then you, you sort of keep the natural pitch. So I've got grains that are industrial sounding, or grain waves, sorry, that I use through to um, these musical ones. I'm going to save save that one because the other one didn't load in for some reason. So I'll just save that one I made up. But I could load in, for example, for a, a drone. This is like the second type of drone. I would go to a lot. Uh, something a bit more, um, let's say, sound effectsy, um, just to create atmosphere for a drone. So let's have a look. We've got. Um, I'm going through these. I've got, I've got about 20 gigs of sounds on here, and I'm trying to streamline the um, file system. It's meaningless to you because you can't see it, but I'm, I'm scrolling through different folders and looking for in fact, something more rhythmic. I've got a, let's see what this, this will probably be pretty bad. I'm just going to load in a um, like a percussion multi sample and then into the granular synthesizer so it's going to be bouncing around bouncing around the drum kits and you can hear it there. I'm adjusting the center point a bit just to create something a bit wild and wacky if I adjusted the um, the size mean or the, the you know the basic uh, size of the grains you'd get more drums coming in but uh, but yeah you can go from industrial type things through to musical through to just really cool crazy
crazy sounding things, particularly if you use an LFO on any of the parameters. So the granulator is loading something else that's um, a bit more meaningful. Let's see if I can choose something else that you might like. So I've actually got on here um, different folders. Um, some of them say multi samples, some of them just MS, some of them say GR for granulators. Let's try some of these atmospheres, totally random. Um, some of them are short. Most of them, though, are, are um, probably 10, 20 seconds, which is quite long for granular synthesis. But it allows me to sort of musically move around the file. So if I can do it on this one. That's with it set at the beginning. So that's um, granular synthesis. And I'll turn the drone off so that we can go into the next type of drone. Uh, just disable that one. Uh, the next type of drones are just noise. So um, you can do a lot with noise for the moment. I'm just going to take a white noise and feed it into the external input of one of these mini synths. And that allows me to then. It's so actually basic white noise, obviously with a filter sweep on. I'm sweeping the filter there. And by the way, I've got a bit of delay and reverb on all of this so far. Um, I'll go through the effects in a second as well. So that's um, that's basic noise, which is obviously combined with some other type of drone. So we've got this bass drone. And that and modulation is very important with noise as you can hear it's just sitting there based on uh, depending on where I've set the filter so I take like a modulation source like an LFO excuse me feed it into the filter adjust the speed and we immediately get that typical non-shell machine jar type thing as a noise drone. Uh, modulation in itself is, is quite complex. This is um, just on a basic sine wave that I can control the control the speed of. But of course you can modulate the modulation. So I often, if I want to do any complex modulation, I will um, by the way, that external source into the simps is actually the sub-oscillator, so it cancels the sub-oscillator. So when I pulled that out, it started playing the sub-oscillator, which we don't want. Um, what was I saying? Yeah, if I want to do complex modulations, I've got the 2HP LFO up here, which I use. I uh, modulate that into the rate, so the rate is constantly fluctuate fluctuating. Or I can use the random next to it, random into the rate, so the rate's going up and down, and it's not um, constant. Um, so that's the sort of types of drones from single notes. Um, for example, the I often use the twin waves. I remember where this is patched now because it's um, slightly different than I had it before. Um, oh yeah, so the twin waves it is a wavetable simp. So these these act as really good drones. The second oscillator uh, doesn't have an envelope, so I can just when I actually switch this rack on, it's sort of normal to be playing without pressing anything. And then I can choose a range of um, yes, the uh, curve planner. The um, granular is it requires a bit of um, fiddling around. I think it took me a couple of weeks to sort of find some sweet spots, but it um, it has its place. You sort of hear it on a lot of popular music now, granular simps synthesis and um, that's certainly, it's certainly um, it harks back to the days I, I um, I'm old enough to remember being in the studios when, when the first Akai samplers came in and I remember accidentally hitting super fast loops every now and then where you'd, you'd be editing it and then you'd suddenly go super fast and then you'd be moving that around and it was sort of very early granular synthesis but it has its place for sure. Uh, what was I saying? Yeah this, this waves twin waves from Clavis as uh, the second oscillator sort of permanently on so it's great again for setting up a um, something that can 
just play in the background while you get your analog thing going, uh, your ambient thing going. And likewise, if I turn the, the sustain up on the, one of the mini synths, I can have two of them going in stereo. Let's pan them. So because of the low, you probably can't hear it, but I've got the um, the clavis on the right or left, and the mini synth on the other side. So that's that's drones. Um, often you wouldn't have the filters super high because you want them to be sitting in the background to have the semi-generative melodies. So there's different types of um, melodic content you would put over the top of your ambient piece. Let's have a gentle drone in the background just as I'm doing this. So I think this is tuned to C, C note when there's nothing else going on. So the very basic, well, the first thing I do sometimes from a generative perspective is I take the output of any sequencer, the CV pitch, feed it into a synth, and I'm just going to use this analog one here, second one as a demonstration. And that in itself is a basic piece. If I, I can change the steps to say three, just so we can hear what's going on. And I can tune it manually. This is on one step, by the way, just repeating on the Hikari, feeding the CV of this synth. And suddenly we get theremin type things. Or if we had a sequence running. You can tune them manually. Um, let's bring that. Let's bring another drone in. Which in itself, I think the tuning aspect of it is kind of nice for ambient music. Perhaps not the um, fire engine going off. But normally what you do with this sort of sequenced melody, uh, sequenced tune, is quantize it. That's the first thing. So put it in, make it in tune. So put it through a quantizer so that now sounds a bit more musical. And and then rather than have it constantly the panning effect, or well, the panning, uh, sorry Patrick asked, can you demonstrate the panning effect? I'm actually manually panning, so this isn't a CV controlled mixer, and what that means is I have to manually pan, so I've just panned, let's get rid of the drones, I've just panned that to the right or left. You can get CV mixers and that would probably be another investment, um, so that you can get auto panning based on LFOs, but it wouldn't be much different than me doing it manually like I am now here. Um, but you'd have a input at the bottom that says CV pan. They're usually a bit bigger and that's the problem I think. I'll leave that playing. But what you'd normally do as well with these sort of um, sequences is gate them separately. So for example, uh, what I mean by gate them separately is is have them triggered by a sort of semi-random gate so that not they're not too linear. So I just use Steppy D here, which is let's see what it's doing. So this is the sequence it's playing, and I can have a mix of the two, so you can have that constant sound, and then this will trigger every now and then. I would do on probability. 40% trying to get something that sounds a bit more musical and then we can have a long sequence so 
so you can hear the gates kicking in. If I take the uh, sustain element off, then it becomes much more sparse, which is great if you've got a drone going. Bit more release for, on the melodic sound. Um, the other thing with a sequence, of course, is that depending on the number of steps you've got, it can sound repetitive. So one of the things I do with this sequencer, because it's a pretty basic one, is I reset it a lot. So I can take, for example, a CV, uh, a gate, or even a random gate. So let's take a... Uh, no, I'll just use the steppy for now, because it's easier. So I'm using steppy C, which is a, a gate track and this is moving pretty slowly at the moment okay, um, steppy C so you can see it moving here and if I put the probability to about 30% or so and I'm going to tell the sequence to reset every now and then just by sending a gate to the reset so what that means is as it goes round you can hear it bouncing back occasionally And the other thing you can do with this sequencer, which is one of the reasons I like it, is on any of the steps, so let's go just on two steps. Let's go on three, actually. On the third step, I'm going to randomize the note. And I'll just take a, a CV off the random here. background. Let's change that. <coughs> change that wave. Um, okay. So that's what I'd call the gate just left by itself triggering that. Um, the other type which I've started to use a lot more now is on the ornament and crime it's got this great little module called Enigma and on the oops go away you um, on the um, hemispheres which you can have two modules running simultaneously it's got this module called Enigma which is basically a Turing machine which is sort of artificial intelligent based scales or they've been set by more humanistic algorithms um, then I can send that uh, I've also got the Turing dedicated Turing module uh, machine here from 2HP so I can use that as well but I'll demonstrate this one working because all we need is so this is the second type sort of semi-generative um, or semi um, semi-random so we need a bit of a, a bit of a um, trigger from a clock so we'll take that clock into the enigma machine sounds very fancy the output of that which is unquantized into the other side of the hemispheres which is um, a basically a quantizer dual quantizer so i can actually have two quantizers if i wanted here and the enigma also generates two sequences but i'll just do one for now and then I'll feed that into um, the, uh, the mini synth again. I can hear it. Um, and the Enigma's playing, in this case, um, a track or a, a series of notes on E8, and I can change that. I can also change the probability of it changing a note. There's a little P thing here, which obviously you can't see, and the range of the notes. If I change the sequence of notes on B6 now, and to make it even more interesting, you can take a random from um, like this random generator over here, and feed it into the scale changing 
so as I see if it's changing, I think I put it in the right one. Yeah, it's on E8 now. Need to adjust the random threshold. I think it's probably the wrong one. Gone to A4. So what I'm doing there is changing the Turing scale randomly. So it means that you're probably never going to hear the same sequence of notes twice. But it's a um, but it's relatively musical and quantized. I've quantized it to the pentatonic minor here of C. Um, I could change the scale to like a blues scale. so on, go back to pentatonic minor, and that's just a constant trigger coming from this clock. Obviously if I took a different type of trigger, like for example steppy C into there, it would play the notes with gaps in between them, which makes it sound a bit more interesting. You can hear the cockatoo in the background there, random mic noises. Shut up. So I'll leave that patched up. So, like I said, we've got random changing the Turing scale in the Enigma machine, which is being quantized on this side, being fed over to this synth here. And then rather than um, have a um, non-constant gate, I'm going to have a constant gate on it. But have a different, um, different gating from here direct onto the envelope. So this is coming from Steppy A. Um, let's choose it. See what's going on. So it's playing all the notes. Probability playing all the time. If I change the probability get that sort of nice background. It's kind of a drone in itself, that sort of background thing, and then occasionally we'll get a filter envelope kicking in, amplifier and filter, and I can control the speed of that. So if I want it less, this is the clock for that gate track. So I've set it so it's very uh, slow. So we've got almost two things happening from the same sound source there. Um, probability gates, well that's probability gates happening there, so probably I'll just check in my sheet. Uh, probability, about 50% of the time, it will be firing one of these notes as it travels across them very slowly. Um, giving that the effect of that. So every now and then you get a speed it up a bit so we can hear something happen. So that's a a form of probability, we've got a bit of probability from the CV pitch, which is actually tuned, quantized, and then we've got a bit of probability on the gate as well for that one. Uh, the other types are uh, Turing machines themselves, so I use this one, dedicated one here quite a lot. It needs a trigger just to fire it, and it will fire out a random, well, semi-random note. So let's just listen to it going through the Turing. Uh, so that's it playing a very high note because there's no trigger going in. So we'll trigger that from Steppy Track B. So now it's going to be... And it's unquantized. Um, the Twin Waves does have a quantizer built in, but I like to use the external ones because then I can keep everything uniform. If all the quantizers are set correctly, I can make sure everything's in tune with each other. Just for the moment though, you're hearing it 
hearing it unquantized. And the Turing machine has a whole bunch of things. It has the probability function, so it basically says on any step, what's the probability of a different note firing at 50% at the moment. If I set it to uh, 100%, that means every note will likely be different. There's also a control of how many steps. It can go up to 64 steps, so you can have very complex things. And then you've got this thing at the bottom, which is a range control, so you can have very low note range. Or a much higher note range, including some of those horrible high pitch things. And of course the speed of the notes depends on what's going on on the, the gate up here. So if I go to Steppy Track B, the uh, clock's very slow at the moment, so let's speed it up. If I change the probability a bit, it means that some of the notes will be repeated. Also I need to quantize it, make it a bit more musical. I tend to go for the musical solution most of the time. And that's on a wave folded sound at the moment. Let's go to something a bit more basic. Uh, it doesn't, again, doesn't have to be that. I can tune the instrument. I can change the range here. What speed are we at at the moment? Let's go back to a slow one. So that's the a dedicated, dedicated Turing machine there, which again I often use as well for things like bass lines because it does come up with some nice, like four or five steps bass sounds which you can then keep if you change the probability of it changing to zero once you found something you like it will stay there and then the final type of semi-generative me melody is um, <coughs> is of course completely random and if I just take for example a random output from one of these random generators put it into the CV it's pretty crazy And I can, before we make this musical, I can change the speed of the change. I can change the range of the randomness using these blue and red. And make it a bit lower. So it's good if you're, in, you're doing a piece and you just want something a bit more, um, how shall I say, crazy industrial sounding. You can do that. That's um, smooth random, which isn't which isn't um, super brilliant. So we often use sample and hold random, which is where I take a sample and hold output and then feed it a clock so that I can control the uh, pulse of the randomness. So this slow clock here on the right, I don't think I mentioned the clocks at the beginning, but there's a uh, there's a couple of clocks here, a couple of clocks there, and there's some others mixed in, but I can control the speed of that. So if I wanted it to be nice and slow, I can go like tenth, tenth of the normal speed, which is this guy over here. This is the master clock I'm using. And obviously with a bit of modulation, you can get some very nice industrially sounding use the right length of lead, industrial sounding um, type stuff. So we're getting a pitch change from the random. And then also we've got quite a bit of resonant filter going on from the LFO here. 
and then adding another low drone. That's going to give us a bit of But that's that's not very musical. I mean, it's fine. You know, if we make blips and blops and those types of things. The cows come home on um, modular, of course. But I want to make it musical, so I often use the random as a uh, as a bass sort of thing. So, for example, let's say I wanted this to be a bass line, which provided a counterpoint to the melody. I'd um, Take the output of that into this a quantizer like the tip top here. The output of the tip top goes into the bass, which is currently playing that. I'd make sure the range of the tip top is where I want it to be. I've programmed a scale in, and now all I need is to trigger trigger the um, the sample and hold so it plays every now and then make it a bit faster so we can hear the changes so now it's going to play a bass note based on the C minor scale um, on the clock here which is constant at the moment but I could, I could feed the random one of these randoms I've got another one where is it there as well I could feed one of those into the clock rate to change the change the bass note it's playing. So it's now playing an, um, an F, E flat. Hopefully you're picking up that bass. And obviously we combine it, say, with the this mini patch I did here. I think with the pentatonic minor thing it's sounding a bit Scottish or Celtic. That's based on the quantizer up here. If I change that to more of a straight scale aeolian. And as before, we need to modulate this low bass drone because it's sounding a little bit too linear. go to the bass again and of course the reason I got these sorts of quantizers I've mentioned it before is I can control the scale so let's say for example I only wanted it to go between C and A flat there's an A flat I can then fiddle with the uh, where are we going from the random control here to make sure we get a good variation of notes in the bass. Okay. So that's sort of semi-generative melody, the bass line's being generated there by the uh, tip top. Then we're into things like effects, so I'm going to change this thing to be a bit more, less, um, so steppy A, I'm just going to change the probability of that one so that it's playing a constant sequence. And it's now running... Um, a step behind this one, so if I slow this one down, this is the Enigma machine. And then 
see there it's stepping across here quite slowly so I'm just going to change the clock of this one to make it a bit faster. So let's go into the effects. So without the effects, that sounds pretty horrible. Typical analog synth. I could have used a sample for this as well, by the way, but I'm just using this to demonstrate the effects. So like I said, I've got um, this routed into this side of the mixer system, which is going into the going into this uh, FX8 XL and I've got I've just adjusted it to get the typical apes um, and it's uh, stereo so it's on each side I've got feedback control and remember this is on master so the the four channels here are all going through this delay in this case and this is um this remember is the Enigma Turing melody playing here. And I've also got uh, a separate output because this thing is then submixed into this one. So I can introduce a nice big Strymon type reverb. Um, obviously, for let's slow this down a lot. And we'll slow the clock for the Turing machine down a lot as well. Oh, it's actually running too fast. Let's slow that down. A bit more of a sustain on it. Um, so, ambient obviously requires some nice, oh, a nice big reverb and like I said before, the FX Aid um, XL. The XL part, by the way, is just so I can modulate things. So we'll, we'll do a bit of that in a second. Let's. Um, I'll turn the delay off. We're just listening to the reverb FX Aid, and you can see I've got different different ones here. So this is a black cloud. It's called. Um, they usually got a combination of decay time. In this case, gravity, and then we've got the tone of it as well. And I think the tone is basically what part of the frequency spectrum it affects. So that's black cloud, uh, black hole, which is based on the Erica Simps, I think. And we've got a bloom reverb. By the way, um, all of these I selected I mean, FX8 has got a great online web page and you can actually choose your own um, firmware update or effects um, listing so I actually chose these by hand put them in the order I wanted them and then um, obviously created a bit of a crib sheet so they're, um, they're I've got sort of the really big reverb so I've got um, I like clouds number 15 got to sort of remember these combinations of, of lights and um, there's sort of four rows on the top and then four rows on the bottom with all different combinations but number 15 I've got um, MI cloud set up and there's a good uh, a good jumping off point to talk about the modulation the reason I got the XL one is that I could take a um, LFO plug it into you can hear the effect of the uh, that's a pre-delay effect. I just read that. So if I, which is number two, if I take uh, put an LFO into number two, let's say something just nice and constant for now. So I'm modulating the whole of the master output here, including everything going through it. So let's see what it's like with the bass. Modulation, 
modulation off. And we get back. So that's again another another little turn the sound sources down. Another little tool if you go into your weird ambient sections is to modulate the effects. And having six parameters here, plus um, there's a thing called SRR, which I think is a bit noise reduction. So I can feed that as well to make the whole thing sound very gritty. And um, I think I mentioned that somewhere, this sort of uh, crushed crushed sound. It's got those inputs as well. Um, so that that's kind of effects. I, I generally only use delays and, and reverbs on on ambient type stuff. The drums are not being fed through the delay side, so if I need um, like a percussion-y sound to be delayed, I can also reverse these as well so that you end up with this being the delay, which is on the final stage, and then this one's the reverb. That's the good thing of duplication. People often say in modular you shouldn't duplicate, uh, but I found sometimes you have to. So um, I've got a few duplications. I've got two mini synths here, two mixers. Obviously for channels that makes no, it's a bit of a no-brainer. And then obviously lots of mults you um, have to duplicate to get the signals around. I've got duplications of quantizers. So it depends really. Um, so that's effects, uh, types of sound. So I've talked about, um, we've obviously listened to these droney type sounds. Um, you could actually, so what I'm doing here is Q Nexus is midded into the disting. But of course the, um, the uh, disting is a multi sampler as well. So I'll just load in a, um, multi-sample that I've set up. And so the types of sounds, I'm finding more and more I'm using, get the delay and reverb back. I'll go back to my favorite, one of my favorite reverbs at the moment. I think it's that one. So this is a multi-sample, uh, it's obviously a steel guitar, if I play it like a guitar, it'll sound like a guitar. Um, I've also, so on a multi-sample, information overload, okay Philip, um, I'll have a coffee break. So we've just been, uh, just to recap, we've just been through the first three sections of that list. Uh, we've been through drone type sounds. We've been through using various things to generate semi-generative melody. Uh, I've just talked briefly about the effects. And now I'm just talking about other types of sounds I would use when doing ambient. Multi-samples uh, is one of them. Granular is another. That kind of goes back to the drones. I would often play, for example, into the pluck from here as well, or use the pluck. So these, these sort of guitar-y type sounding instruments through a nice reverb and delay, or just reverb in this case, sound gorgeous for generative. I'm bringing in this Enigma machine thing. So that's a mix of Turing Machine and me playing live. Also, this uh, the disc thing's great because you can have um, three multi-samples loaded. And I've got, I think I've got an electric piano on the second input here. So I'm playing the first input. These, these three rows are um, basically CV and gate for each of the, depending on what you've got set up. I've, I've got two set up. So in the second one, I could have, 
the same notes that this guy is getting. And that's why you have mults, because I can take the output of the ornament and crime, feed it into there, and then feed that into both the, um, the uh, multi-sample setup here, and also back to the, the mini synth. So what you're going to hear now is I, I just need to gate that one, because every, everything needs, well most things need a gate and a CV to operate. A gate is when to play. So I'm going to take put the gate of that from. Uh, let's see what C is doing. So this is now the disting playing a piano sound. Nice mellow thing. So when I bring back the mini synth, which is playing the same notes, but on a different gate system, you get this lovely sort of um, merging of the two. And of course, because the disting's in a double multi-sample mode at the moment, I can play over the top of this. The, um, in fact, I might tune this up so the piano's, so I have to find the, um, the right parameter on here, which is just the octave setting. So I'll tune the piano up a bit so it's playing in the higher register. Tune the guitar down a bit. And often in ambient, you're trying to give things... Um, this is more about mixing, I suppose. In ambient, you want the like a bass, drones and pads separated from the higher frequencies. So I'm going to just bring in the bass, see what that's doing. fiddling with the, the bass sound so you can hear it. I'm adding the notes back into the scale here so we get a bit more randomness on the bass. And remember this is coming from a random sample and hold from a slow gate over here. Base. Right, now to, and this is where you're building up the instrument. So we've got a bit of a sub, which I think should be coming through the, um, the stream. I was worried about super low bass sounds being cut off by YouTube or something. In fact, I'll add, I'll add um, the octave above as well, just so we can hear what's going on with the sub. And then we bring back the Enigma stuff. In fact, the Enigma is driving the top piano as well, of course, at the moment. The gate's a bit fast on A, so I'm just going to slow the clock down a bit. And now, of course, I can still play the guitar-y sound. Apologies, if I hit the keyboard too hard, it's hitting the table, which is hitting the mic, so that sound. I've actually got a padding underneath it. I need to separate it from the table somehow. Of 
course I can put the, um, if I want to control the harmonic progression, um, in fact I'm going to, if I want to stop the piano by the way I can pull out the gate to it and then go back to just the subs. Sometimes I want to double up on the subs so I, might, I often use like a super low one, which is playing now, and then using a malt again, so take the output of this random bass thing, put it into uh, my malt, take it back over to the original sub bass mini synth, and then take another copy across to, and it's not far away actually, so I don't need a long one, <coughs> another copy, a copy across to this twin waves. So I'm now going to double up on the subs and then choose something here that I can put for a filter. I haven't really talked about filters yet, so I'll probably, um, in fact, I've been through most of the other topics actually, but I'll um, do some filtering now anyway. So you're just listening to the Twin Waves 2, which is going through the delay as well, so it gives it a bit more richness. Um, I'm actually going to filter that. The way I, I've got these filters set up is that I take the outputs to here, put them through the output, the filter, and then put the sound through the filter. So I'm going to put that one through the Wasp, which allows me to take away a lot of the um, higher frequencies. Getting a bit of a tangle now. What was I doing with this? Um, that's what I was doing. Oh, that's from the Enigma. Oh, that's sorry. Yeah. Just uh, sorting out some cables. So this is going through the Wasp, the Clavis 2. And you can see it allows me to do all sorts of things. I could go heavy on the resonance to create something pretty wild. Or I can just use it as a bit of a low pass filter uh, but the nice thing about it is, is is I can also modulate the filter to make the this bass sound a bit more interesting and then that in combination with the the lower sub bass one A bit of panning on both of them, although bass is less panning specific. We've now got quite a rich um, drone going. Bring the piano back in. So you can hear the, the building the piece up. You can go too far, of course, and some people go for much more minimalist type things where you've literally got two things playing. Sorry, this is the <laughs> this is the trigger for that piano sound, which I'm I need a system where it can just sort of float in space because often I'm pulling them in and out for a piece. And um, the other types of sounds we can use, obviously, sort of mellow sounds. So that was a steel guitar on here. Um, we've got um, obviously electric pianos that we just used. We've got road type sounds. These are all multi samples. It's no different than loading them into your favourite keyboard based sampler. And because it's polyphonic, we can go very traditional in terms of. You know, major seventh type chords and things, but um, ambient tends to be sometimes non-key specific. 
I do that sometimes. Uh, other types of sounds, um, obviously prepared pianos are um, trendy as well. These are the ones that are either hit with hammers or um, I've got special special things attached to them. Um, these sorts of sounds, which are much more aggressive, you would kind of have, you know, hitting very occasionally rather than using them too musically. Bit of distortion there. Um, other types of sounds in ambient. Oops, wrong thing. Um, obviously, acoustic sounds. These Dolcima type things are nice. These came pre-installed on the um, one of the folders on the disting. To kind of cool, very acoustic. But we're sort of in the realms of traditional synthesizers here, so um, you know it really is just about your taste and the types of sounds you want to use. I'll find something else. Perhaps uh, obviously strings. We've got low string, tremolo strings, all that sort of thing. We really are sort of browsing, and I I did actually originally want to get away from using these mini computers in um, your rack, but it, it does provide a extra dimension to what you're doing. So they're kind of nice to create that acoustic feel of course. I'm just going to load in. And there's multi-samples you can obviously download um, rhythmic things. In fact, let's let's do that one just for a bit of fun. I'm going to load in a drum folder and then just randomly send a random to it, see what sort of thing pops out. I um, don't know if these kits, let's try that one. So I'm just loading a multi-sample drum kit, which sounds like it's not the sort of thing you'd use in random, uh, uh, sorry, in ambient, unless you're triggering them very uh, sporadically. So that could work, so I can actually just take complete random output. Have you got any left? I'll do that one. Sample and hold into that input. Sorry, that's the trigger. Um, oh no, I want to want to do pitch, and then we'll take a just a basic gate. And we just need to trigger the sample and hold now. In fact, if I take that one out, we can do it. Let's do it totally randomly. So this is just random CV controlling the pitch of this multi-drum sample. And then I've got a really basic gate. I could take the gate from something less less obvious, like Steppy D here, and then make it clock very slow. And then we get into sort of drum randomness. Let's see if I can get it so it's choosing the right notes. Made the clock too slow, I think, because there's some probability on that as well. So this takes us sort of into rhythmic elements. Um, so that's coming from um, a gate track over here. You can look at the bass drum. Let's just take a um, basic bass drum from like a four to the floor. 
which is on its own separate control up here. I can control the rate of that if I um, um, take a different clock. In fact, I'll use one of the steppy clocks, steppy B, just for now, so we can hear it. I don't generally use a lot of bass drums in ambient music, but what I do use them for is like these are very occasionally, very occasional. I'm just going to choose a slow clock on this one. Let me just get rid of that percussion-y thing. Why are you still playing percussion -y thing? Oh, you're up there, that's why. Um, what was I saying? Yeah, this bass drum. I tend to use it so it's like a big, occasionally a, like a full sustain accented, just to give a bit of background pulse, particularly to the drones. So it's sort of very orchestral. Hi Bill, just spotted you joined. So it's like a big orchestral timpani to the drone. Um, but I tend to use the Pico drum more, which is a much more flexible type of sound module. So I'm just triggering that same as the bass drum. Uh, I've got a range of different parameters in here, so we can go from like snare drums to um, tom type sounds. I'll uh, just increase the gate so we can hear it a bit more. Slow the gate down. See what that sounds like with the drones. successful percussion sound but you have to with the pico drum uh, let's get rid of the piano with the pico drum you've got to um, sort of oh you've got some very cool modulation built in as well for the parameter cv so let's see what this is doing so it's definitely something you need to preset with this one you can't sort of busk it on the fly because as you go through the different sounds you can end up with some quite horrible ones jumping in like that one let's just go for a basic rhythmic hi-hat at the moment which occasionally based on the clock here I can slow down to something more decay on it so it's not too intrusive with the rest of it and you can see I'm playing playing way too fast on the... Let's just check the gate for that one. So the piano is playing a bit fast as well for my liking. So I, this is one of the things you do with ambient. You can slow everything down later. You have to sort of have them gating quite fast so you can set the sounds up and then you can slow it down. So this trigger's coming from Steppy D, 
So I can look at the clock and I can go, right, I'm going to slow you down to a lot slower. So now we can get a bit more. more gentle. sounds you've sort of heard the analog synths I don't need to do that there's wavetable stuff as well which um, I generally because this uh, clavis I don't think has a MIDI in correct me if I'm wrong but I can play simultaneously and I haven't done this a lot simultaneously from this keyboard so I'm playing the multi sample on the disting and then I can to, um, using CV play oscillator one from this twin waves and I'm going to use a this is when I'm running out of gate tracks so I'm going to double up on some gates so I'm going to have it play what's one of the fastest ones I'm using I think that one yeah I think steppy a is playing reasonably fast or oh, I can adjust it often when I'm doing an ambient piece as well I'll see these clocks here so we're listening to listening to the mini synth. I can change the clocks on the fly, so that's now going pretty fast. But I'm going to double up on that clock, that gate. Sorry, I always get mixed up between clocks and gates. Sorry. So I'm going to leave that one in the mini synth. Go into this malt over here, that's why I've got the malts next to the steppy. Duplicate that clock over to the clavis one, and then I just need to feed the malt with that clock. So, what's going on is this steppy A is feeding both the mini synth, which is that sort of um. Twi um traditional analog sound but I'm also taking the same clock into the clavis one and let's see if this is working um, so the sound I've got set yeah. so that's a horrible sound just to hear it working Use a sine wave instead. So I'm going to use the built-in quantizer for this because these notes are coming from the keyboard. It's not quite in tune. So there's a bit of tuning required. In fact, I can just tune this bit. And um, because the clavis is not polyphonic, it will always play the last note. So if I play a chord, guitar chord type thing, it will always play the last note. And again, because this is gated from steppy track A, if I speed it up, it'll be both speeding up this sequence as well on the mini synth. Obviously works better. Change the gate length. Obviously the gate length going into the clavis is quite short. Let's just check it. Oh, can make it a bit longer. It's less important with the mini synth because it's got its own ADSR built in. 
Really, I should use a uh, separate ADSR. In fact, I can do that. Instead of um, taking the gate direct, I can actually take the envelope of one of these mini synths. So it should allow me to take advantage of the the release and the attack. Bill Smith asking about the delay reverb. Yeah, I just did a whole section on that. Basically, I've got FX8 XL, two of them. One of them is dedicated to delay, which is what you're hearing there. Turn it off. And one of them dedicated to reverb. Yeah, they're a bit high at the moment. I was just demoing them. I think I left them on a high state. So this doubling up on CV, so the Q-Nexus is providing a CV to the clavis and a MIDI to the disting. It's all right then. And then, I would often filter, filter the clavis a bit, but there's sort of one built in. So we'll get a bit more gentle on that sine wave. So that might be good as a sort of start of the performance. You can oh, this is leading to some kind of performance of this piece. It's a sort of patch from scratch. Yeah, good point, Bill. The um, both Happy Nerding FX8 XLs are from um, Ukraine, and you can support um, support him. FX8 itself is a kind of a rally for support. So um, go to the Happy Nerding site, and uh, you can send stuff direct. But I think there are lots of um, more efficient aids. If Bill can perhaps put a link up. Um, yeah, Bill, I, I went through the QNexus firmware upgrade. I don't use it because um, it's the sequencing side and all that, because it's sort of under the surface. And uh, let's turn that off, it's driving me mad. Um, because the sequencing's under the surface, so I, a lot more flexibility in the sequencing here. This one's very much a um, the QNexus one update. It is sort of very traditional sequencer type thing. I don't think that there's uh, much probability and chance and the electron type stuff in there, but I may be wrong. But I don't like things too much under the surface. Like, is it multiple, you just press all these function keys and then you can program them, program them in. I think it's Q, uh, Keith Macmillan sort of going after the um, key step side of the world. But I think on the red ones, the latest shell case, you can... Um, you can get, um, sorry, they're labelled a bit better. Anyway, I'm diverting. So what was I doing? The key thing there was this doubling up of CVs on, on a minimal piece. So if I slow, let's slow this clock down of this one. Step A, yep. It will now be copied onto the clavis. Reverb, and it's always weird mixing um, these sorts of things on your headphones because you often underdo the effects because they're in stereo, so you're less, you're hearing less of the effect. I think. Bring the piano in. Where's my little trigger gone? Oh, he's all the way over here. This is what I mean by temporary trigger management. OK, 
Okay, you get what's going on there. So it's not a very complicated patch so far. I've I've been um, trouble with modular as you're constantly rearranging. Turn the piano off. Constantly rearranging the modules so that the the most used paths are where the patch leads go. So I'm, I get to the point sometimes that I'm, it's kind of semi-normalized by that. I mean, it's it's so arranged that it's only a couple of patch leads and it's doing types of things I want it to do. Um, fixed sequencing versus semi-random. We sort of went through that. <clears throat> um, one of my little go-to modules for this sort of stuff is this arpeggiator, this 2HP ARP, which I often use to trigger it from a basic clock. Um, just show you it working. We'll take, in fact, we'll take a uh, long enough lead. This is moving patch things closer together. So clock from up here into the ARP. So that's been triggered on every beat. And then just the output of that onto a sound source. So I think I'll use the pluck here, just so you can hear this working, to provide. And we just need to trigger the pluck as well. So I'm going to molt, molt that clock at the top. So again, same, same four note clock into there and then duplicate that over to the pluck. Uh, this is on um, this is on a random mode so it's playing a C minor chord because I've tuned it to C minor but randomly. And as you know, with a pluck, you can change the attack sound. And I might actually take the clock for the um, pluck the same as the... Same as the... Oh, from Step EA, which is the same as two things now, so that's tripling up on it. And, but we've got the changing the notes itself, which I can take out happening a bit too fast. So I'm going to take um, those from the percussion -y sounds. In fact, I'm going to take out the percussion sounds altogether. And I'm going to use Steppy B as the arpeggiator clock. Let's see what that's doing. Yeah, good point, Bill, as regards the happy nerding. Uh, sometimes best just just go and buy from the stores uh, any happy nerding gear. And that will no doubt eventually get back to Igor, we hope. So what was I doing? Um, yeah, I'll donate to any of the Ukrainian things. But if you want to be you know, part of the modular community, connect um, directly to happy nerding and find a way of seeing if you can get it direct to him. Um, so Bill, yeah, you were late. You're like one of those late children that walk into the classroom and the teacher goes mad with because he's already covered it. I've already said with the FX aid, I um, did a custom set of effects and this is my crib sheet on laminated paper because I will event eventually recognize them, but you are swapping them out all the time. So I've updated the firmware of both of them. This reverb is the black hole reverb. Um, I could change it to the um, black cloud. Let's see what that sounds like. The pluck. So yeah, one of the reasons for getting the happy nerding Ukrainian stuff was not just because of the the war, was because of the um, very good emulations of like the Strymon big big sounds and the even tides and the Ericas and so on. Um, yes, Bill, back to back of the class. I hope you've done your homework as well. Um, anyway, what was I doing? Yeah, the pluck. So the, the reason for doing that pluck was to show that the um, the arpeggiator over here is useful as, as an extra sound that you can step into. So that's your straightforward triad. I've added a seventh on the arpeggiator. 
I can choose any random chord. If you want a bit of a like a B section to your piece. Back to the minor. And that's just the triad. If you put it on uh, random though, it will choose two octaves up and down any random note. So you get a little bit of semi-generative type stuff going on. And that's kind of nice. You've got the pluck and then a multi-sample of a guitar on the disting. Let's bring the A-flats in on the bass. I can force an A-flat. And then force a C. an E flat. Get rid of the um, get rid of the uh, rest of it and then we can go into a minimalist thing. So this is the piano on the Distinct two. Where have you gone? There he is. So back to virtually nothing. Perhaps just a touch of sub bass. Very low guitar. So I've rabbited on long enough. Thanks for the, um, the folk who have uh, chipped in with some questions. I'll leave the chat open for a bit. Well, I'm going to go into just a 15 minute performance because I've been going on for one hour 45 and that's way too long. Um, but thanks for the, I've had um, 138 people drop in, which is great. And um, so let's do a quick 15 minute piece because I've got to open uh, my photo gallery now. Any other questions, please ask. Um, probably, uh, for those who were here right at the beginning, the granular stuff I was showing, probably need another little module to play granular. I might see if there's a small one, because the case is reaching, not being full, but it's reaching um, most of the things I need it to do. Um, like I said, I've got a, the Mosaic quantizer being fixed, which sits here. I'm also, I've also got a line output amplifier headphone thing which sits here. <coughs> so I'm probably on, going to be on the lookout because I often use the disting as multi samples. Probably on the lookout for a dedicated granular thing. Just modulate this bass and then we'll get on with a little piece. Um, doo -doo -doo, that's too short. See that bass uh, drone is just a little bit boring, so let's give it a little bit of. A little bit of that didgeridoo type thing. So thanks, Patrick. 2 HP grain. Cool. I'll have a look at that. Probably can make room for a 2 HP somewhere. <coughs> I'm not sure what I don't use now. I think the key with modular is that you're always um, checking what you're using or not. Or not. I do, I'm not using it at the moment, but I do use the Akari, even though it's quite big. It's the biggest HP in here. I do use it a lot for live performance and things. Less on the um, slow ambient things. And, um, but yeah, 2 HP grain could, I wonder what it could replace. Uh, that's the problems with modular. Right, 
So I'm going to go into non-mic mode now, just do a quick performance. And because um, I'm capturing this on decent audio, this may be a piece in itself, or just a little 15 minute piece or so, 12 minutes. See you next week. <laughs>